Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the next edition of, of Game Camp. It's, it's really great to, to have so many people here. Today, we'll be talking about LTV measurement and predictions. So today, to the, together with us, will be uh, Robert Magyar, uh, who is the data science lead at Superscale. He will Hello, be guys. Talking... Hello, Robert. Uh, he will be talking about predictions uh, for LTV uh, measurement, especially in case of UA. Uh, then we have uh, Ivan Koziev, uh, who is head of analytics uh, from Crazy Panda. Uh, he will be talking about uh, uh, their experience uh, with, at first, uh, how they created this LTV model from the beginning, from the soft launch, and then how they actually uh, how they modified, how they adjusted once the game were, uh, games were getting more mature. Hello, Ivan. Hello, hello. Uh, and today we have, uh, together with us, Lucas Bertolina as well, who is the business development manager working at uh, uh, Google Brazil. So, uh, hello, Lucas, as well. Hi, guys. Nice to see you all. So, I think today we have a really great uh, topic. So uh, please remember that, as always, uh, you can join our discussion on Slido. So uh, just go to www.sly. Uh, uh, and uh, enter the discussions with uh, with GameCamp. Uh, with that, you can actually ask questions and uh, vote on those questions. So we'll be happy actually to touch those questions during the the, the sessions. Please use this opportunity to. Uh, ask about all those uh, things that are related to the topic and in some way we're not really touched or uh, you would like to go deeper uh, with them uh, in, in everything related to LTV uh, measurement and LTV calculations. So uh, again, Slido uh, and GameCam. So not making that, uh, that, 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 that longer, uh, let's start with the first presentation today uh, uh, from Robert Magyar, who will be talking about LTV predictions for growth and UA uh, activities. So, Robert, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, so, sorry. Let's jump into presentation. So, uh, who am I? I'm Robert. I'm head of data science and general manager at Superscale. I'm really, really passionate about helping game studios all around the world to grow their games. Across different genres, would be uh, building our teams, would be analyzed. So these are some of our achievements. We analyzed data of 1 billion players. We optimized millions of dollars in media spend, and we brought millions of dollars in revenue uplift. I'm really fortunate to be at uh, Superscale. We are a growth partner for top game developers. We focus on user acquisition, business analytics, and monetization. These are our partners. Some of them you probably know, you've seen them, their logos, you play their games. I would like to encourage you to play their games because they are awesome. So let's jump to the presentation. So we have a situation here. We have a game, we have a product that started to uh, start do user acquisition. And it works well pretty well from the start. You can see it on the picture on the left side. We have LTV, we have CPI, and we have spend. LTV is basically the one-year prediction of the LTV. So we can see that LTV is above the CPI for the whole time frame, and the spend is these purple bars. What happens, studio starts to spend a little bit more, maybe two times, maybe three times. Performance drops. LTV drops because there is no enough quality players, uh, even after increasing the spend, and CPI increases. What happens is actually that CPI and LTV get so close to each other that actually the recoup gets far, far away. So this happens a lot in many games. So user acquisition cannot really scale further in this case. So the question is, how to combat scaling issues in your game like that. If you're trying to increase that spend, but you see that your LTV is not high enough and your CPI just grows. So let's jump into it. So first of all, uh, how to scale really revenue, uh, how to scale, scale the game. So we need to bring quality players to user acquisition. 
we need to optimize engagement metrics and we need to optimize LTV. So for the sake of this presentation, we are not going to talk about any uh, game design. So we are not going to optimize engagement metrics. But what we can do based on data, we can actually improve user acquisition and we can improve LTV of player base. So in this, in this sense, there is no development of new game feature, new game modes, and we are not going to add anything unique to the game. So we are just having the product that is already built and we're trying to increase it, uh, increase the, the LTV and bring better players for the game. What we need to do is measure, predict, and if we measure it properly and predict it properly, then we can optimize. So two areas to make the biggest impact using data. One is user, user acquisition optimization through data. So really um, putting together marketing and analytics. When they work together, it is great. I'm going to show you some of the examples. What, market, what analytics can help is to predict result of, results of user acquisition and enable seeing user acquisition trends and patterns is the first thing. But the secondly, how analytics can help is by targeting better quality players. So I'm going to show you some of the localized that maybe you can build for your game. The second thing that we're going to show in this presentation is in-app purchase LTV optimization through data. How to really optimize your special offers in a way that your rotating offers, your seasonal offers, and progression offers are going to just better. And the key is to really do both at the same time. So there needs to be synergy between doing great optimization of marketing and of course, optimizing the LTV of in-apps. So let's jump to the first thing, improving LTV of attributed players. So marketing without proper analytics support, really in, in today, is it possible? Yes, it is, because what we have seen frequently is that we, uh, our customers, our customers, uh, they, they come to us because we need to fix this, of course, but what they have, the state, is that uh, they have many different sources of data. It's hard to drill down to really understand the performance of campaigns, cohorts, creatives, assets, countries, platforms, and many other things that you basically need to see to really understand what is happening with the user acquisition. And many times, the prediction system are just not accurate. There are many, many benefits that analytics can actually bring for the marketing. I, I just categorize it to the short term, mid term, and long term. In terms of short term, better informed day to day decision about changes in creatives, campaign, and ad sets. So, really, analytics in that sense can help you understand day to day trends, day to day changes in creatives, in performance of creatives, in performance of campaigns and ad sets. It's really useful for really my micromanagement of the, of the user acquisition. In terms of midterm benefits, so analytics can help you understand weekly and monthly user acquisition strategy regarding targeting creatives work, where do they work? Many times the strategy changes over time and we need to understand whether they're going to work or not looking at the predictions and so on. In terms of long term, uh, it is all about the risk in scaling. So F, as the, the budget scales, uh, we need to have proper spend budgeting and understanding how the recoup or break even day changes over time, because it changes. This will show you at the start. Okay, so do you have the right to support it? Can you really on each day check every campaign, ad set, how they perform, do you have the prediction attached to it? Sometimes it's really hard to build something like that, but in general, the infrastructure should be built in a way that aggregates all of the data, tracking data, tracking of the game, attribution platform data, ad networks data, Google Play Store data, iTunes Store data, UA channels data to one data warehouse. Uh, we use Google BigQuery for it. On top of that, you can build your prediction system. Again, you can use Google Cloud, uh, Cloud products as we do. And uh, you need to have a monitor system. And at the end of all of this, you can get something like this. So dashboarding, which can help you really be actionable. To be actionable is the key. 
So I have several, um, several examples here, how to be actionable with the data. So we have a creative team, of course, and uh, this creative team does uh, their creative, they create the team of the creative, uh, and they wanna see how it works. One of the easiest things is, can, that can be done is check for each creative, the performance that the creative actually has through ROAS. So you can check ROAS day three, ROAS day seven, ROAS day 28. With this kind of view, you can easily spot the best creatives and you can optimize based on that. Creative team that needs to look at these creatives which are the best and understand the patterns. Is there some sort of pattern? Is there other elements in the creatives that are the same? Can we learn from it? That's the key. So by improving creative targeting, bringing higher quality players, you can improve LTV attribute players like that. The key is reallocation of the spend. So in this case, we would reallocate the spend from the creatives that are not profit profiting as much to all others that are just better. In terms of quickly identifying better strategies, can you really, based on how you do the strategies over time, can you really quickly understand whether your strategy works or not? Do you, have, you, have you built success threshold, for example? This is really, really important what we found out. Uh, user acquisition needs to have success threshold uh, tied to some of the days, for example, day seven, day 28, because based on that, you can understand what your strategy that you do from now to you know, one month, and you do, do the prediction, whether you actually can pro proceed with this strategy or change it. In this picture, we can see weekly cohorts with the success thresholds, and you can see that all of them are basically hitting the threshold that was set up to have the recoup of one year. Identifying the most long-term profitable campaigns and reallocating spend to them is really, really important. So in this example, you have a campaign prediction. So this is a prediction for, basically do prediction for each of the campaigns, cohorts, and so on. In this case, this, um, this campaign has pre-given day of 16, you can see on the um, down on the left side. 16 days is pretty, pretty good result. So the idea in this case is find this type of outliers, this type of campaigns that really produce great regular days and you take your spend from all other campaigns and put it to that. But really the getting as quickly to the prediction, getting as quickly to the to the result is is what makes it actionable or not. So waiting like a two months, three months is not actionable. You can actually build this pretty fast if you have a robust, a robust system. But of course you want to actually increase the revenue of the, you want to increase the budget, daily budget. And if you increase daily budget, we know that the CPI is going to increase also. So for example, for this campaign, you would like to increase budget for that campaign. But what happens if you if you actually do? CPI increases. So understanding the CPI to spend relationship is the another key factor in understanding how can you scale your campaigns. So in this case, what you have here, you have on the X axis uh, daily spend, and the daily spend basically produces some sort of CPI. If you add to the CPI your LTV to your benchmarks, then what you can actually understand, you can understand the function between CPI and spend, and you will understand how will this change in the future if you increase your daily spend, for example, to 600, 700, and so on. It's really important in basically trying to increase the spend to achieve desired recoup, because by increasing spend, it could happen that you actually go of your recoup will go more to the future and it will not, not be good for a, for a planning, for a business, for budgeting. Many times it happens actually this, um, that if you have some sort of prediction model, need to be sure in which cases your prediction model actually does some error. error. 
So if the error is more tied to the uh, overestimation, so for example, your uh, model will tell you you're going to get $100,000 from that campaign. But in reality, because the model overestimates all in general, on average, almost always, then you would uh, basically in reality get only 50%, 70% of that 100,000. This could happen a lot actually. So as the model is built, sometimes it happens that the error is not distributed properly. An error is skewed to the one side, like on this picture, but the distribution of error is skewed to the right side. This produces overestimating real revenue and overconfidence that we are going to actually get more money, but in reality, it's not going to happen. This can lead to wrong decision making. And not many um, UI managers are actually looking at this. This is crucial. Um, okay, so overconfidence in this model, which does some sort of error in terms of overestimation, can be a problem. But also, on the other side, underestimation of the real revenue can be a problem. So this can actually lead you to missing opportunities because you would actually um, maybe stop the campaigns that will be profitable, but because the model tells you that they're not going to be profitable, you are going to stop it. One of the profitable things is by creating localized from your player base. So um, targeting most profitable players for a game is the key and increasing the this can increase LTV by by a lot. In our experience, experience it increased ROAS by 20% and more. This was actually like a creating localized can change because of the changes that come to iOS. But for Android, it will be still relevant. The idea is to find the best possible representation of the players in your game. And we need to ask some questions that are really, really important. Is this group? Uh, yes. Uh, can I have the question? There yes. was a question around because you, you started with uh, with the infrastructure, mm -hmm. like you know to build it. Uh, like you know, how long kind of does it take to to build such infrastructure? Like, uh, is it about uh, like uh, and and when it really makes sense? Actually, yeah, it's like if you could look, if you could touch those two two topics. Uh, building infrastructure like that, what we build, it takes like, a lot of really talented people, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. uh, um, the, how long it takes, well, it depends on a lot of factor. I know it could like, be one year plus if you have like a really great team because there are so many parts that you need to handle in terms of integrations, in terms of like a prediction system alone. You need to have mm -hmm. not only one data center, you need several of them. It's, it's really based on the spend, of course. Uh, if the spend is really, really high, then it actually makes sense to put more data scientists on a on a prediction system because basically they can skew the the decision making. But it it can take years actually to build something like that. Mm -hmm. But it depends on what is the end goal. If the end goal is spent several millions monthly, then of course uh, I think that for the proper mm -hmm. decision making to have this kind of infrastructure and it will take a lot of time. But if you are spending just a little bit. Uh, you are trying something that maybe patient system doesn't have to be so uh, so precise. Maybe you don't have to integrate all of these things, but I recommend to do it because of the reasons they are basically showed in our presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and again, uh, of course, I encourage everyone to add questions at Slido uh, at GameCamp. Okay, so, so continuing, I talk about the creating lookalikes from the segmentation from, of your player base. So the idea is to find the best possible representation of the players. And you need to ask this question, in my opinion. Is this group great at buying in a purchase? Do they do it frequently? Is this group heavily engaged? Does their engagement grow over time? That's really important, whether it grows over time. Does this group of player watch ads frequently? So why these three questions? So it's really important to stack the probabilities. It, finding, doing the great segmentation can be really, really complex. But if you look at different uh, attributes of, the, of your player base and you find the best of the best from each of them, you can actually stack the probabilities and it's going to be far more, 
probable that uh, the, you really find the best place for your game. Uh, testing always important. So A-B testing your lookalikes, these segmented lookalikes, likes with all the other lookalikes that you have, really important. So you need to have a benchmark and compare it. And after you evaluate it, you can profit from it. Like I said, it can be 20 plus percent of the ROAS. Uh, one thing that you actually need to um, try to do is uh, maybe uh, expand it, this group more and more and watch the uh, CPI and watch the LTV that it brings. This is one of the things that actually cannot be like um, set how uh, big group do you need and what was going to be the CPI because this is really like a unique group of players that you will, will find. Okay, so. Uh, let's have this like a simple segmentation, okay? We'll just look at the LTV, and this is LTV of the game. This pretty good LTV, we see that there is a, a blue line, which basically tells you real LTV numbers in that day, and you have a purple line, which is the prediction. So, as you basically segment players, you will get different... Yeah, Robert. Um, yes. Just before I get to this point, on the last slide, you mentioned about creating mm -hmm. the groups. Mm -hmm. And I find that usually people create too many groups because they have a hard time choosing how many they should start. Yes. Do you have any guidance on that, on your experience? Uh, yes. So um, too many groups. Um, though I think whether the number of groups is important, I'm not sure whether it is like if you have too much of this group. But what I know, what is important is the variation between them. So what you really want to create, if you create different groups of players and you don't know which of these groups is the better, you need to be sure that there is, these groups are just different. They are not similar. Because if they are different, then you actually can un understand or learn which of the type of the player is the better for a game in terms of creating localized and getting them. Many times what, what happens is that um, segment, segments are very, really similar to each other. Uh, you use, for example, purchasing power or something like that, and you just change these levels of purchasing power and you use these uh, segments. It's not enough. So you need to experiment in, in, uh, in lots of attributes, but in general, uh, make sure that, uh, or everybody should make sure that the variation of the group is high, so they are really similar group of players, and just try it and A-B test it um, against each other with your benchmark. And then uh, you need to be you need to be like a very data driven in this sense because when you see the results you should scrap all others and and, and create the variation from that best result again and do this until you see some variation in performance. Okay. So moving on, so um, this is just an example of segmentation uh, using just one attribute, LTV. And e even in this, you can see that there are three different groups that have just different uh, LTV curves. So in this case, you would really want to just pick one on the left, one on the middle. Why? Because one on the right has that flattening there. So even in this case, you are you already uh, getting to the point where you are filtering these players and you are trying to understand which you think is the best for your um, for your game. And after that, you create, like I said, this variation of different groups and you are going to A-B test them. Okay, so one last thing uh, in this uh, part of the presentation is uh, there are sometimes questions whether we have enough data for the LTV predictions. How can you spot it? Uh, because it depends on the span, it depends on the conversion, it de depends on the number of payers, number of players in a group, and so on, installs. There are many factors. But how can you spot it? Whether you have enough players in a group uh, is by looking at the LTV curve. If the LTV curve actually looks like, like this on in this example, that just LTV curve just jumps and then flattens out, jumps again, flattens out, then this is the, uh, there could be many, uh, many uh, more causes of it, like for example, live ops offers or something like that. But if you see it many times in that LTV curve, then you, you, sh 
you're probably this this high chance that you have very very small amount of players there and you need to increase it so it means to increase conversion uh, conversion or which is hard of course increase conversion so increase the spend or your targeting of players okay so jumping to the um, next section uh, improving yap ltv so how to maximize revenue from your special offers so just having this exercise so let's let's play a little bit so imagine having 10,000 special offers in your favorite game this is your favorite game you play it every day of your life which one would you want to see in your next session would you would you be happy with any random offer or is there some sort of preference you think there is preference would you want five dollar uh, offer of 100 dollar offer what amount of coins how much discount how should this uh, offer look like many games are showing offers to players that players simply don't want uh, either they are random or they are picked in uh, with the simple rule based system so how do we battle this? How do we increase this attention of the player and that the player really wants to see these offers and try to choose the best one for him? We think that uh, personalization is the answer. So many other industries do personalization of content, which helps them to improve monetization experience for each customer. So in the free to play, for, for the free to play games showing relevant price and content at the right time for the player can increase your LTV of your player base. So let's look at some uh, models, basically. So you should now, basically, when you look at the game that you like, maybe that you work for, maybe you should basically uh, know that one of these system uh, will be that you use. Now, the random offers is the first system is basically random predefined offers that the expert is, is built and there is no targeting no filtering of offers and what we found out that actually this kind of system uh, they are not really uh, great they when you are not really doing the personalization you miss with this kind of system 50 to 100 percent of your revenue this is all from our case studies Rule-based system is the system where you have several predefined offers, could be like 100, 500, I, I saw even more, uh, where, there, where you have if statements. So if player played uh, in this rank and he bought this, you will give him this. So this is basically the system. Um, comparing to personalization system, true personalization system, you're missing up to 50% of the upper revenues. But dynamic personalization is the key here. I'm going to talk about this. So you dynamically create offers based on the data that you see that uh, uh, based on the preference in data that the player created by his actions, by the you know how, how we engage with the game, uh, what was his uh, what, what was his monetary action, and so on. Many times, machine learning models are used to understand the preferences of players. Uh, and or probabilistic models and this should maximize your revenue so these are case study one of our case studies when we increase um, LTV by 35 percent and uh, this is on a multi-million game okay um, this works uh, for any genre what we found out if it is if the game is focused on in app uh, in a purchase of course so the the range of the uplift that you can see is to, from 20 percent for more simpler games that they don't have as much to offer in terms of like a different items and different game modes and so on to rpg games that have a lot of to offer more game modes different things that different items that you can sell and so on so this could be 100 percent and can be this can this be done safely using can actually what you can do is try it on a, on a small amount of players maybe from some, some countries and you will just see that uh, whether it works or not how you do it in practice is that you have a control group which is your system uh, mostly this rule based system and then you have the dynamic personalization 
and you split by 50-50 and you watch the, the results. This is just the example that showing only relevant offers is, is the, the thing that we need to do. Um, it's important that this model that you, uh, that you create or somebody creates uh, will pick everything for your offers. He will tell you what type of chests you should uh, give to the player. What, what should be additional value? What type of price point? Should be low price point, high price point? Even with the upsell strategies, you actually can do upsell strategy with it. So should you upsell this player now or just wait one week? And of course, changing the background amount of resources. How much coin should the player coins should the player have or gems and so on, even the text. The idea is that when you you know that your system, offer system, special offer system that you have is great, if you can do this, if you can increase the revenue per user while minimizing the discount. If your system currently is tied to the discount very much, then you need to put a lot of discount there to actually make somebody happy, then it is not a good system. And to go around it, to really do this, you can, uh, you have to optimize every aspect of the offer. So what type of price uh, should we put there? What type of content? What type of value? Should we wait or not? How much, uh, how many uh, hours should the, the offer be available, what is the visual aspect? And the value is in the personalization. So actually the side effect of the personalization is that the, the thing that you will show to the players is so good for him, that it will actually be good with the lower discount. Personalization process is like that. So you have a data, you have a model which learns the preferences of the player's segments through using the data. You create new offers dynamically based on the, what a model tells you, and you deliver the offers to everybody in the game. Of course, if you're testing for 5% users, only these players are going to get that offers. Infrastructure can look like this. This is the example of infrastructure from one of our case study. So you have your player's data, and you have your data warehouse where you put all of your data. You need to have the pre-processing, so you need to get to this to the point where you, you have the tables from which your machine learning models, your probabilistic models can learn from. So basically, there is the pre-processing, there is a need of the data scientist to be there. You have the data modeling. Mostly, uh, what I've seen and what I've seen that works is actually separate and create more models than one model. Why is that? Because trying to find different segments of the players while looking at the engagement data and pricing data and discount strategy and upsell can be really complicated even for these type of models. So what you want to do in general is create one model for pricing. So this model will output only price that should get the player right now in the time. And the second model for the behavioral modeling. So uh, there's going to be content, there's going to be discount and so on. Then you have your offer assets. These assets you can imagine having like a chest, having coins, having gems, having skins and so on, particular skin even. And you, based on that, what models basically says that you should give to that particular player, uh, you will basically create dynamically that offer and then you will deliver that offer to a uh, player that uh, should get it. So in this case, you see there are many types of offers, different, different visuals, different discount, different prices, and so on. So this is the end result to having really not 100 offers, but really having thousands of offers really catered to the uh, data, to the, to the player preferences. And continuous improvement is something that uh, is really, really important too, because this kind of system can give you like a 20, 30, 50% uplift straight away, but you can get actually 80 maybe, if you really play with it, if you really understand, you analyze it and so on. And like I said before, this is the result. Uh, we've seen this over and over and over again, so it works, uh, this for sure. And like I said, it can be done for any of the game, which is enough focus, and, but the complexity of the game actually is really important for it's much complex game, the, the uplift is going to be higher. 
and this is basically everything. So just a summary. So struggling with the user acquisition after increasing the spend is like, a, like we've seen it several times. The spend increases to the levels where the, basically the CPI and the LTV just cannot hold. CPI is so high and you cannot produce this, this high LTV or find these high LTV players. So leveraging your game's data to the full extent can significantly improve LTV of your game, which can unlock even further spend scaling, even further spend scaling. This is the key. So you are going to get to the point again in the future that you need to improve your LTV even more. But for the time being, you can actually increase your spend two times, three times, four times, five times. That would not be possible if you don't optimize user acquisition and in app purchases like um, um, in this way that I uh, show you some examples. So there are two things special for personalization, utilizing existing game content can bring significant amount of revenue, extra revenue and optimizing user acquisition decision making user data can result in additional LTV ROAS increases because it can help you reallocate the spend better, uh, create better budgeting, safe budgeting, uh, create localize which, which can improve ROAS by 20 plus percent and, and so on. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the for the great presentation. Uh, so maybe just uh, like uh, one question from the uh, from the audience. Of course, we'll have the discussion panel at the end. But uh, uh, one additional uh, question: uh, the question was how how this like LTV calculation and predictions uh, is different uh, in case of hybrid games than in case of like you know IP heavy. Uh, like you know, of course we know we have the ads data, uh, we have the in-app uh, revenue data, but how it's kind of done from the practical point of view. Uh, Robert, I think you are mute. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. In terms of models, it is not different. You can use same models, but what what you need to do is change the data that comes to the model. So as you have more hybrid hybrid games, so you are in the middle. I don't know, fifty percent ads, fifty percent in apps. What you need to do is really try to leverage more at uh, like attributes. So add, add data and app data on the same level, I would say. But if you go to the more in app focus, you don't have to take a data at all. Mm -hmm. like at all because it would be just you, confusion. Mm -hmm. You need to still to have kind of, you know, both parts of the data at the user level, yeah? Like, or something like that? Well, user level, for the for the special offers, yes, for the uh, user acquisition, it doesn't have to be user level, it can be core level, uh, mm -hmm. without issue, like daily, weekly. It depends on the, on the use case. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and let's maybe go to the next presentation today. Uh, let's invite to the stage Ivan Koziev, who will be talking about uh, like how, what kind of the experience he had with, you know, building the LTV model for, for the games and then uh, adjusting them once the, the, the games grew. Thank you, Ivan, you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hello to everyone once again. And uh, I will be talking about developing an effective LTV model at soft launch and keeping it further beyond. Uh, I hope my presentation will be a nice addition to the uh, Robert one because, well, uh, he was talking about inner things. I will be talking about LTV itself. And uh, let's move on. Uh, do not waste too much time on uh, introductions. Um, so, well, at least I have to spend a little bit. Uh, my name is Ivan Kazuyev. I'm working as a head of analytics at Crazy Panda for almost three years now. And uh, well, I'm very passionate about the games and uh, analytics. And guess what? OK, so a little bit more about Crazy Panda and why it uh, is so important. We have uh, those three titles. And as you can see, those are quite different from each other. And even uh, one of them has uh, some sort of uh, admonization in it. So we have a really diverse portfolio of products and uh, this four is not the only products in uh, our portfolio, just uh, I want to put it here to show the diversity and why it is very 
uh, important. Uh, those those games uh, all suffered uh, some problems with uh, LCV models, uh, building them, uh, maintaining them, and I think uh, we was able to figure out some common patterns in their LTV modeling. So I want to share them with you. Uh, the, there will be no, you know, huge uh, mathematics based uh, things here. Sorry for that. Uh, for those of you who come to the uh, to them, to see them and to hear about them. But uh, I hope I will give you the base points uh, to think about uh, what should uh, everyone do with their LTV. And uh, then you can proceed further beyond. And uh, uh, well, if you will have any specific questions, feel free to ask them during the presentations or at the panel. I hope we will uh, cover some areas uh, a little bit more. So uh, first, let's make some basic definitions. Uh, first of all, LTV, I hope everyone here knows what it is, but uh, just to be sure, it's lifetime value, amount of profit attributed to entire relationship with the user. And for us, it's usually uh, the time, lifetime is the time uh, that user uses our game, plays our game. And uh, the lifetime part here is uh, really, really uh, the most important thing. But uh, we'll cover it a little bit later. So. Uh, how? What is the LTV itself? Well, first of all, uh, it can be individual for LTV of the one user, or it can be aggregated, usually average, for a group of users or cohort of users. Uh, this is, well, calculate uh, LTV is very simple, so uh, this is not uh, a problem. And for a cohort, it's well, just one division. Uh, and LTV can be actual or predicted or forecasted. Uh, this is not, you know, the official uh, difference, but uh, it's, it makes sense to keep this in mind. So the actual LTV, we can uh, calculate very easy, just gather the profit from the user who stopped uh, using our app. And well, that's it. Uh, but predicted one uh, has much more value, <laughs> value of lifetime value. Uh, sounds weird. Whatever. Predicted one is much more valuable for us as we can make decisions as uh, Robert just uh, showed us in the previous presentations, which uh, was really great. So I don't want to dive deeper. I just uh, refer to the Robert one, uh, Robert presentations and move on. Predicting LTV is uh, quite different on different game stages. Uh, at soft launch, uh, for example, we do not have uh, a lot of data. We have small amount of users, limited data about them, and even we usually do not know length of lifetime of our users. You know, uh, for example, we do in soft launch, launch for like two months, and uh, our possible lifetime will be like a year. We have no chances to knew it uh, before the well, one year. And uh, you see, here is a problem. We don't want to leave a soft launch for like a year to build an LTV model. And uh, this is the main challenge at the soft launch. We just have to work with it. Well, uh, on the other hand, we have a plus here as the uniform users. Soft launch uh, commonly uh, perform in the few countries like Canada, United Kingdom, uh, uh, Poland, for example. And uh, since we have very low amount of uh, countries, we have uh, quite similar users from them. And usually we use like one or two uh, sources of traffic with similar optimizations I will be talking about. It's a little bit later. Uh, this can help us to build our first uh, LTV model since it's soft launch. So, sorry. Uh, what should we do? Well, we should go with general things like extrapolating or interpolating with uh, our LTV curves with uh, some functions. Uh, we can uh, build simple uh, uh, probability models or uh, go wild, but we cannot uh, use uh, some something advanced like uh, machine learning just because we do not have enough data to supply it. And uh, we have to be ready for some uh, to apply some heuristics just because, well, once again, we do not know uh, the full lifetime length at this point. 
The second step uh, is the some time after the global launch, where we have uh, some data, much more data that we had previously. We have uh, settled user behavior, uh, defined uh, user uh, lifetime, for example, and uh, we know how users use different parts of our game or app. And uh, well, we have much bigger user diversity. Uh, as we go global, we uh, start acquiring users from different countries and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here we can uh, improve our models. We can build the specific LTV models for different use cases. And I'm strongly suggest uh, doing so because, well, this uh, helps tremendously with the accuracy that will drop after the global launch because of the diversity that we hadn't had at the soft launch. Uh, we can build some combinations of different approaches to LTV modeling. And of course, uh, machine learning starts to be a thing here and uh, it will help us uh, to leverage our efficiency uh, to very good uh, points. Well, there are there is one more stage of the game, it's the game maturity. Uh, once uh, all main core features are settled, uh, once the dust settled after the global launch, uh, once you start to develop a game uh, well, further beyond. Uh, and uh, what are the main points here? Well, at first, we have a huge amount of data. <laughs> well, more than at the previous stage. Uh, but uh, we have, on the other hand, a problem here. We cannot use some or even most of the data for training our models because, well, we made some changes. We're making some cha changes in the game. We will be making some changes in the game. We will add some features, layers of monetization, even uh, uh, very, very, a good thing from the previous uh, presentation, the dynamic offers, for example, and we have to put the impact of those features into models somehow, but we do not have enough data for that. And well, this is quite challenging. And in my opinion, the most challenging part uh, for predicting LTV, because we have to keep our models up to date uh, with uh, coming and coming new features. Uh, well, approaches here are really diverse and uh, they really depend on the game that we're talking about and the lifetime in that game. For lifetimes like a month, it will not be a problem, but imagine one year or two years of lifetime. Uh, so we should have one, more than one model uh, working on a different set of features and uh, uh, models on their model models working on their very robust features that are not affected by new uh, layers of monetization, for example. Well, we will need a regular validation of LTV predictions because we, we do not want uh, to overestimate or underestimate our, uh, our actual LTV. And uh, there will be, I will be talking about slicing technique, uh, the special secret sauce uh, here. I hope I will have enough time, so just uh, leave it to that. Okay, uh, stage is settled. Now we are talking about predicting LTV. Uh, at this point, at the soft launch, we do not have a lot of data. I just uh, remind you about uh, the things I was talking about one minute ago. So. Small number of users, unknown life length, and uniform users. Uh, and nevertheless, we have a data and we can create that uh, LTV curve. The problem is usually, uh, and uh, lucky we if we don't, we don't have uh, that problem, uh, we do not have the whole curve. Well, LTV can grow longer and longer and we have to somehow uh, calculate uh, the lifetime length or any other sort of uh, breakdown uh, which we will be aiming. What can we do? Uh, first, sorry, I hope it's okay. Uh, first of all, you can uh, interpolate or extrapolate uh, your available data depending on that, 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 sorry, that data. Uh, 
what are you doing is uh, really dependent on the available thing and your knowledge of the game. So I will not be talking much here, but uh, it is a really interesting point and we can have a, a very long discussion about it, like the whole presentation dedicated to just uh, uh, building the first uh, functions to extrapolating, for example. We have to choose correct metric to approximate because, well, once again, uh, we cannot uh, extrapolate just an LTV curve. We can go deeper and deeper. I will cover it uh, in a minute. And uh, we have to work around each cases. Uh, it's always handy and uh, always a good idea to work around. So what is the LTV? First of all, it's the function of time or days from uh, registration, for example. Uh, but this is time, function of time. Uh, the second thing uh, for LTV is it, uh, as it is uh, accumulating value from the users, uh, it has to be always growing. So the next point will have to be uh, bigger or the same as the previous one. Next thing here is that uh, once uh, time is uh, very big, like infinite, uh, we have to reach our maximum LTV. So if we extrapolate our data, we could come to something like uh, that on the screen. Uh, this is the most easy and uh, starting point at the soft launch. We do not have uh, a lot of data, but we can go uh, deeper as the data uh, will be collected and acquired. So some extra notes here. First of all, product, product knowledge is crucial at this point. Uh, well, it, it's crucial at any point, but at this is the most uh, crucial thing. You have to know the monetization limit. For example, uh, you may have uh, monetization depth uh, limited by, for example, uh, content availability. At the soft launch, you may not uh, have infinite content in your game and you will have to work uh, with uh, what you have and well uh, so LTV will not be able to uh, go to like twenty dollars per user just because you do not have uh, the depth uh, for this and for user behavior also if uh, users somehow use some features that add monetization layers you can uh, uh, make a decision from that also, uh, I promised to talk about other curves that we can uh, approximate uh, to use to supplement our LTV predictions. And uh, there is a very easy thing is the retention and uh, RPU. Uh, so for example, users pay the same amount, let's say uh, they pay same amount per day of life. Uh, so we just need to extrapolate uh, or approximate our retention rate and uh, well we just multiply it at uh, every point uh, to that mpu of our users and uh, get a great result or even we can uh, go crazy and uh, add uh, the dependency for view also for time just because uh, games tend to and uh, well in good cases and best case scenario uh, games tend to increase rpu uh, with uh, time passed from the registration. It's the healthy uh, stage of the game. And we will have uh, different scenarios uh, based on that. And once again, choosing from those scenarios is the product uh, awareness and uh, nothing like that. Well, until we have some data to uh, validate on. And uh, well, of course, uh, we want to have a scenario two a yellow line with the uh, almost linear uh, growth, but uh, in most cases, we do not have uh, this one. Only very good games uh, like uh, Robert showed uh, have such LTV curves. So know your limits, understand your user behavior, and uh, do not uh, hesitate to use very simple approach. As a matter of fact, I want to talk about uh, the most important step in uh, more LTV model development, and I think in any model development, uh, and uh, this uh, step can be applied to any further talks I will be, ha I will be having, so uh, I just want to 
put it here and just to remind you a little bit in the upcoming uh, slides. So what is the most important step? It is forecast validation. Uh, we have to verify e and uh, determine the predictive power of our model because uh, if we will not do this, we can end with some grim results, uh, our model being inaccurate and uh, our decisions uh, may be wrong. Uh, to summarize, and uh, most of you who are very familiar, familiar with uh, machine learning, uh, I just want to place a few points here. Uh, they are quite uh, logical and uh, quite obvious, but I want them to be put here. So first of all, always have a validation sample that you will be testing a model against. And uh, your validation sample, of course, must be representative. Uh, so like putting five users into validation sample will not be representative. So do not do this. And uh, do not overfit for validation sample because, well, uh, you can uh, overfit on it, uh, build the model to be bad, to perform best on validation sample, and well, in the real world, it will struggle. Uh, those are common things, and uh, I will refer to them uh, in the further uh, slides. Okay, so sometime after global launch passed. Uh, and we are ready to improve our model. Uh, what can we do? Uh, the most easy thing to do is uh, choosing the model metric and uh, improve it. For example, we can shorten uh, the confidence interval for prediction, a uh, very uh, common thing and very uh, easy calculating thing. We can lower the sample size for reliable results, and uh, we can uh, use the model uh, to not just predict the whole campaign on the campaign level uh, LTV, but uh, go deeper for ad sets on our ads. Uh, we can also reduce the amount of time or data, it's uh, mostly the same needed for our model. So we can uh, receive results not after the seven days of uh, play, user playing our game, but uh, like in two days. Uh, it will be uh, more effective for UA activity, for example, to switching off uh, bad campaigns and uh, scaling good ones. Uh, but I want to say that uh, almost all three, not, not almost all three of these uh, metrics are very interconnected. And uh, well, you can guess if we lower um, the sample size for our model, we just uh, can widen the confidence interval and uh, receive, receive those results from the same model without any improvements. Uh, this is just natural. And uh, what can we do to improve our models? First of all, I want to talk about the product-wise approach, so-called, as we call it, uh, in-house. Uh, this is building up uh, different models, uh, just expanding our model park to just uh, supplement uh, different needs. For example, we can build uh, different LTV models for different country groups, like uh, split them by their conversions or uh, engagement and uh, use it as the uh, as the baseline for our LTV models. Because once again, uh, on the soft launch, we had very uniform users. Now we have diverse uh, and different users, and we want uh, to calculate them not in the same way mostly. We can go for LTV models for different sources, and I strongly recommend uh, doing this even for uh, much more com complex uh, models because, well, uh, for example, if we buy uh, conversions on the Google Ads, uh, buying with optimizations for conversion, and uh, buying traffic uh, on the video networks uh, for like uh, reach and volume, uh, those uh, two types of traffic at uh, two types of users would be quite different usually. Uh, so you may get much better results building different LTV models for them. Or you, of course, can build LTV models for different transition types uh, that vary dependent on the product. Uh, you can go, for example, uh, one model for in-apps and uh, one model for app ad-based model, uh, ad-based uh, revenue, 
but uh, you can also go for something like uh, LTV model for live ops events and LTV model for regular purchases. This also can be helpful because uh, increasing the uh, putting this uh, different uh, monetization models in the same LTV model uh, can lead to increasing in dispersion and well uh, to uh, much lower accuracy if you don't have enough data, for example. At this point, uh, we will not be drawing in data, and uh, to my experience, we will never draw in the data. We, we will also want more and more and more and more. But uh, all those uh, product-wise approaches are very similar to building a features for machine learning L, uh, LTV model. And uh, those of you who are familiar with it, once again, uh, machine learning already have guessed it and uh, asking why, Ivan, why would, you, would we want to do this? Because, well, machine learning is the key, it's very good, and it has advantages. Uh, those advantages are that it can solve and take into account all dependencies at once, the dependencies like uh, we just talked about. Uh, it can even identify very complex relations much more uh, hard and deep than uh, just different countries or different uh, uh, install sources. And they can give very accurate results, so even per user predictions, uh, which are not achievable with the classical models, LCV models. But on the other hand, uh, machine learning approach also has these advantages. First of all, as I always said, it needs a lot of data. Uh, the more data you have, the more chances you will succeed uh, with the machine learning approach. Also, it takes time and skill to develop. And uh, well, I think uh, that everyone here will have a skill uh, at some point, or even already have a skill to develop it. But time is a very crucial thing. And uh, if you need by whatever needs. Uh, if you need uh, the LTV model like in one week, there is always not a good idea to go for much in learning approach at first because, well, one week is a small amount of time, even if you have your data prepared. That's dependent on the uh, case. So that's quite uh, discussable here. And uh, of course, you the LTV itself is a metric that is very complex itself for machine learning approach. This is like uh, very counterintuitive, uh, but on the other hand, uh, predicting LTV, LTV itself is quite a challenge, uh, usually at that, at that uh, stage. Uh, Okay, I'm here in Lucas here. Yeah. Hey, Ivan, just a quick question there. Which are the biggest mistake you saw people making when creating, like when using a machine learning for, for that topic specific? This one. Uh, and, uh, what's the question? <laughs> and, I, and I imagine that for a global launch, this is quite uh, challenging, right? To, to do yeah. like a uh, the most uh, the most you know challenging thing here is uh, making your validation sample representative so uh, you have to on one hand uh, have it really uh, diverse to cover all uh, type of users that you have all type of uh, acquired sources that you have uh, all type of uh, ideas that you put into your audience. And on the other hand, you do not want to throw too much users here because, well, you want uh, as many users as possible for your training. And uh, here is the thing that uh, user behavior changes uh, with time, like you adding some features. I will be talking about it a little bit later, but uh, I think it's okay to put it here. And uh, you just want your validation sample to be as uh, up-to-date as possible. So you can uh, really test your model on the real data, not on the old one, uh, maybe outdated in some way. Well, so this is this quite a challenge and uh, it's just, uh, it just takes time and practice to validate the results correctly. 
Uh, so, returning to the LTV approach, uh, the LTV itself is a metric, of very complex metric, and it's usually uh, quite hard to get good results with uh, that amount of data that's available after some time after global launch. So, uh, how can we use machine learning uh, to build and uh, to adjust our models, LTV, of course, models? Well, first, first of all, we can predict shorter periods, uh, for example, 7, 40, or 28 days of uh, air PU accumulator. Well, it's perfectly made sense, and you can use it to use along with existing models, uh, just uh, giving them more data, data points, uh, faster, uh, fast acquiring data for them, and uh, reducing one of the metrics uh, I was talking about uh, a few minutes ago. <laughs> You can also predict proxy metrics uh, other than LTV uh, that are much easier to predict, like pairs. This is a classification uh, problem, not a regression one uh, as for LTV model. It's usually on the same amount of data. It's usually to solve classification problem, uh, easier to solve a classification problem than uh, regression. You can also go for number of payments, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, summary for this part, uh, just so we have uh, enough time for go to the secret sauce. Uh, set a target model uh, metric for improvement, decrease in sample size, data needed for predictions, etc. Et uh, try different approaches, predicting proxy things like pairs conversion or even classifying, classifying pairs by their type whales, dolphins, marrows, non pairs uh, is uh, quite a big thing and can. Uh, help with uh, LTV predictions much more than just making an inaccurate uh, machine learning LTV model. And always think about how to use, uh, how this LTV model will be using. Like, if you build a model for UA team, it needs to be very good for small uh, amounts of uh, users to uh, UA team uh, be able to uh, distinct their good campaigns from the bad ones, good ad sets or ads from the bad ones. They need to make decisions on the campaign uh, ad level, for example. On the other hand, if you build a, a model for uh, strategic uh, cases, like uh, strategic decisions, you can go with uh, much higher much bigger sample sizes, but on the other hand, you have to build very precise model. And uh, this applies some restrictions on the models itself, on the models that uh, we are building. And once again, mind the validations uh, uh, as uh, the questions, uh, the question that Lucas uh, just said, validation is the key. It's uh, very crucial to know how your LCB model perform, if it's underperforms or uh, either uh, overperforms, it's always not very good, obviously. So major game, uh, our game passed global launch, uh, dust settled, we are ready to add new features, we are implementing some new monetization layers, even maybe going for those uh, sweet uh, dynamic offers. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, our LTV models will be screwed up, like, very badly. Every time we add a new feature, especially LTV models, uh, powered by machine learning, they will be in very bad state because uh, we, can, we have to add new features, we have to adjust uh, features that model are using uh, in some, some ways that we uh, maybe do not know. And uh, we cannot wait like a year to get a good sample size to retrain our model because, well, we cannot go blindly for one year. And, uh, well, it's obvious that uh, if the update is bad, we will be losing money due to incorrect predictions. It's nobody uh, wishes uh, this one. But on the other hand, if the update and new feature added is good and uh, we added some money, we also will be losing money due to not scaling our development on marketing like uh, the Robert in the previous presentation said. So both those things are bad. We want as fast as uh, possible LTV models uh, up to date. 
and uh, well dealing with those issues is uh, in my opinion the most uh, challenging thing here and uh, once again i will be referring to our portfolio uh, we have very diverse portfolio very different games in it and it happens to almost all of them and even the work worker club the poker game which is very set in stone very uh, robust uh, game process itself, e even it uh, suffers uh, big features uh, like two or three times per year. And we have to adjust our L2 models. And for a poker game, lifetime is like two, three years, not just one. We have to adjust our models. So what we can do? First of all, we can uh, return to soft launch techniques and build a quick new model uh, for validations. We just uh, uh, compare this new model to the old ones and uh, if there is a big difference, uh, well, we are in trouble. Uh, if there is no difference, we can view uh, and keep calm and uh, proceed to the next point. So it's just validation. Uh, secondly, we want to have uh, we want to retrain our machine learning models, and at this point, we usually have quite a lot of them. Quite a big part of our L3 prediction will be relying on L3, uh, on machine learning. Uh, we want uh, to retrain them as soon as possible, and it's quite handy to have a few models using very limited amount of robust uh, features, as I said. If we are able, we have to do an A-B test, but uh, sometimes it's not the case. We cannot uh, add the gameplay feature just to half of the audience. Usually it's not that good uh, in terms of relationship with our players. And uh, well, once again, uh, we can use our product knowledge to measure an impact on uh, monetization and changes in user behavior. Uh, quite obvious to say, quite uh, murky to you know, actually apply. I know, uh, I will try to explain it with the next case. So, uh, I'm sorry, a little bit. So, the case, uh, live ops events. Imagine we have a game uh, without so-called live ops events and we add them uh, and already done like three or four of them. We want to understand the impact on LCV, but for classical approach, we need to like wait one year of those uh, uh, live ops events, or even not like a year, but at least 10 more times. Uh, but maybe we can go faster. Maybe we can supplement LCV with extra knowledge using the picking in those uh, new events. So what can we do? I call this a slicing technique. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm the first one that using it, uh, but uh, this helps us in uh, adjusting LTV curve. So, okay, we have LTV curve and uh, we want to slice it into smaller periods. For every period uh, that we slice, we want to define a cohort on which we will be using on which we will be validating the results, uh, calculating the impact of the, those uh, uh, live ops events, uh, in this case, but uh, on any impact. And then we can normalize those impacts, calculate the final, final improvement. And as always, do not forget no novelty effect because it's quite a case. Uh, to just uh, illustrate it, uh, if you look at the graph uh, in the right part of the slide, you can see that the first and even the second one, uh, second uh, outlier is uh, a little bit bigger than the third and third, fourth one. It's the novelty effect uh, since we just added uh, the live ops, a uh, new type of uh, new monetization layer. Uh, it's usually, if it's uh, built good, uh, in the good way, uh, it's usually produces the novelty effect and we have to you know, calculate it uh, and uh, adjust for it. So we, we will have like a new LTV curve that will be higher. And uh, in this case, we won like 10, uh, to be honest, 11% of uh, LTV. So we can use this 11% and uh, leverage our regular results, uh, just uh, removing any events from those uh, live ops uh, feature. 
and not supplementing in, supplementing them into the previous models. So uh, the models remain uh, the same, robust and healthy, but we just uh, multiply them, for example, or we can go even crazy. But I do not have uh, enough time to go crazy. So thank you everyone for listening. I hope you learned something. Uh, this is this was very you know on uh, very on top uh, review of uh, how we can manage uh, the LCV models through the game uh, cycle. But if you have any more uh, specific questions, feel free to ask. And uh, thank you for watching and being here. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, I think that's good introduction to uh, to our like discussion. Uh, we, we can spend a few minutes like you know discussing uh, all the things you you you, you and uh, Robert uh, mentioned. Uh, so uh, like uh, looking at the uh, at the questions, uh, like uh, it's it's kind of question that I, that I think can be interesting for for you. Uh, like you know, uh, like a lot of people right now is is talking about the iOS 14 and like you know, uh, like potential impact for 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 that like you know both for uh, topics like Robert mentioned uh, like you know lookalike uh, analysis and, and and segmentations and then uh, even uh, how do you think what does it change it in case of uh, LTV calculation prediction does it change a lot or uh, not much as we can think? Uh, well, for us, it will be changing a lot as uh, one of the most important features for us uh, are not ones, one, but a few of the most important features uh, are some, something like uh, using user origin, uh, user uh, country, and mm -hmm. uh, well, user country is still available for us, but the user origin uh, type of uh, optimization that we are using to acquire those users will will be obscured for us, and uh, we will have to rely on more robust, but on the other hand, uh, less uh, accurate models. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, as for head of analytics, I do not like those changes. As uh, as a user, I uh, totally agree with them, and uh, I think uh, this is good for the industry itself. Uh, but uh, from some point, uh, we are not relying very much on the features that I already mentioned. So I think uh, for LCD, it will not be such a huge case. But for optimization, whoa. <laughs> Very, very huge impact. And Robert, what do you think? Yeah, so we did quite extensive research on the topic. We are quite, we are not sure yet. Uh, we know how will this impact, but uh, what is the actually the end result? So the a prediction, like a core prediction, should be okay. Uh, in terms of lookalikes, this can be problematic. Maybe, maybe not possible for the iOS, uh, for the Android, still possible. So there is still like a way to to use it properly. And for some games, what I've seen, just Android performs better in terms of attribution. So um, uh, it depends on the game. Yeah, what's going to be the effect? <laughs> And uh, like you know, one of the uh, another questions is uh, uh, like the, the question if uh, I think it's more like related to your uh, Robert uh, presentations like you know uh, it's possible to uh, it's possible to track day three day seven ROAS at the creative level for Google app campaigns with such uh, calculations. Uh, can you please repeat the question? I in Google app campaigns, oh, it's down after, to okay. track day three, day seven ROAS at the creative level, because you were mentioning this creative uh, as the as, as the level, mm -hmm. and uh, what about Google in this case? Uh, because like you know, the Google reporting will be different than yeah, the case. Of, uh, let's see Facebook. Uh, what I was showing was actually the Facebook uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Facebook uh, channels in terms of. Go up campaigns. I would need to get back to my data engineering team, but uh, uh, I'm not sure. But I think it's possible. Not sure. Not sure right now. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, Robert, I think there is another question for you. Is mm -hmm. do you use reinforcement reinforcement learning for offers? 
Okay, so um, the partnership that we basically built is that uh, for our customer in terms of special offers is, is quite, uh, uh, it's important to bring as much uplift as soon as possible. Enforcement learning in this case would be quite a risky thing to start with. So as we start the partnership, we were doing probability modeling and trying to move to the machine learning. Not so much to reinforcement learning because it it basically it's more uh, risky risky for for the games because you need to of course there is that that exploration that you need to do to actually get to good result and uh, many times you don't have basically time to do that because you want to increase that uh, revenue as much as possible as quickly as possible. So this is only possible for the partnership that lost uh, that last like maybe one and a half years, um, but it is possible. So we did quite a few designs for it, but uh, we didn't go through it, uh, through with it uh, because of this reason. It's quite risky, you need to, it's way more complicated in general. And the upside, the question is if you basically optimize the, the machine learning models quite a lot, what is the upside? Because we know what is the downside, but what is the upside really trying to do this? So in terms of uh, like a business question, it's it's hard to hard to answer. So no, no, we we had designs, but we really went to, to with it. Uh, and then there's like uh, 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 one question around uh, uh, like we know that uh, like you, when you create this LTV model, uh, you can actually you can you can you can optimize it very conservatively, and then of course. Uh, in this case, you will have lower risk, uh, but then usually with lower risk goes uh, uh, way, way lower uh, scale. On the other hand, you can make it a little bit more aggressively, but then goes uh, a bigger risk of uh, like error. Like uh, what is kind of your advice to, to cope with the challenge, how to kind of um, try to uh, minimize the challenge, how to kind of you know, get good trade-off for, uh, for that uh, challenge? Okay, so starting with a uh, uh, rule-based system is the way to go, then moving to probabilistic systems and machine learning systems. I think that many times what I've seen uh, somebody who's trying to do uh, this kind of stuff is uh, they try with a hard approach, doing machine learning straight, straight away, but you really need to learn a lot about the player base. We need to do a lot of analytics and using rule-based systems like that you can actually understand uh, it's, it's way more trust, transparent. That's, that's, the, that's the idea. So you are starting with something that is transparent that you see that if you change something, that you will see the effect easily. In terms mm -hmm. of machine learning, you cannot do it. And so I think starting with uh, something that is, is less risky and the uplift is not as high, but uh, you have time. Basically, we are talking about a significant amount of revenue and you can go from month to month to different models, but you need you, you need to take care of that of that month. Yeah, starting with something simple, really transparent, and moving to high like uh, complex, way more complex models. But the, in this case, when you mean when you saying like rule system, you mean okay, uh, like let's go to let's get to the point when you have more like knowledge. Like okay, if you increase budget by. 10%, then you will have a bigger scale up, up to 20%. Like, you mean that kind of rules? Uh, no, no, I, I meant uh, for the special offers things. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in terms of that, you, you don't need, uh, but um, the, like, uh, there are so many factors to, to change the CPI in general. So there is a seasonality, there is a market, there is all of the other things. So, um, this any of the LTV improvement needs to be that's the point it needs to be significant because uh, the five percent or seven percent can mean just that uh, okay you get seven percent but the CPI mostly increases by a lot when you increase the, the spend so um, uh, yeah some of the things that I showed uh, they can create a significant uplift and then you really unlock that uh, the, the budget uh, two times three times maybe. Uh, but in general, of course, it is. And then what you do, you increase the budget, you hit that 
uh, the issue again and you get back to it and maybe try new models, maybe try mm -hmm. more complex, but you already know something about mm -hmm. the libraries. Uh, many times, for example, special offers, it is really hard to, um, not really hard, but what you need to do is manage the manage the expectation. You need to manage what, how many, for example, machine learning models can give you two times, three times the same offer in a week. Do you want to actually uh, show players three times the same offer? So it's more like a, how to that machine learning model get to the point where it can get understand these rules that there are real people that we are showing this stuff to. And we just cannot expect to, to show again and again same thing because some of the model just tells us. So uh, mostly what it is, it is combination of like some expert rules with the machine learning. Uh, so it makes sense. So there are, because of that, you need to have some some uh, more models and uh, like one model. And uh, you can have a model for upsell strategy. You can have a model for activation strategy. And on top of that, you build something like uh, something which will take all the information from this model will actually decide decide which what is the best and how you should proceed so mostly um, the idea is to build more things separately and then aggregate the information and control that information at the top mm -hmm. thank you yeah, and, and for, for Ivan and I think for Robert as well, have you seen any specifics for emerging markets when you're creating LTV models? Uh, well, <laughs> I'll take the lead. Sorry, Robert. Uh, hope you don't mind. No. Yeah, we, we, really, we really see the difference. Uh, and uh, as I can say, uh, this, once again, dependent on the game and the current offer state, for example, because obviously uh, for Brazil users, uh, you will have to change your uh, in-apps uh, in some way, uh, for example, in compare to United States users. And uh, the way you change it is uh, really different from the game, uh, from one game to another. Uh, if you do this, well, uh, the different uh, LTV models are very natural just because you have different monetization processes here and there. If you do not do this, uh, you can go with general model, in my opinion, with supplementing it with just uh, region or country uh, features that will help model to understand uh, the user behavior. So in almost all uh, matters, I'd say, yes, you have to build those different models because, well, once again, uh, monetization, different monetization processes can help uh, monetize and uh, get more value and get also uh, give more uh, excitement to the users from the markets that are different from the top tier ones, for example. We clearly see this in Russia as our poker game is quite uh, successful here. so. Uh, I'd say this is the thing for almost every market and even maybe uh, on, on the country level. Uh, okay, so, so so in this case, uh, like you know, there is, uh, we, we, we talk about like, you know, LTV calculations uh, for hybrid games, but there is actually even like, you know, two questions around the ad monetized games. Uh, like, you know, uh, did you work with uh, like, you know, any LTV calculation predictions for uh, such types of games? How it's differ for, uh, from like IP games or it's maybe similar, uh, if you could like share a review, maybe starting from Robert then. So in my experience, it was not different, uh, but we mostly focus on uh, in-app focus, uh, focus games. It was not different. Uh, you, you like you uh, data track in apps, you data track ad revenue, and uh, then it's basically always the case of uh, creating maybe look likes uh, that that you, because you wanna really find the players that are best for uh, watching the ads, and this is the same uh, game in my opinion in terms of CPI to LTV. So uh, it was not an issue that. 
course, the the revenue is way more uh, like small. Uh, so there could be a problem with the sample size in general. But uh, yeah. But uh, how, how in this case do you deal with uh, like with with a lot of those factors that you cannot control in in case of other monetized games like you know. Uh, like mediation, like you know, ECPM. So, uh, so I think like those, those factors are a bit more challenging to to control and sometimes to analyze, especially at the deeper level. Uh, like you know, what is in your approach in this case? Approach is that we cannot be as confident as we would be in general with the, with the prediction. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's why we focus mostly on app games in this sense because. Like you can control all of the basically stuff, mm -hmm. and you will be pretty sure. So um, the boundary for the at LTV is to be like wider, mm -hmm. and is to be monitored quickly uh, and more frequently, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, to be sure. Ivan, anything to to add? Uh, well, I, I'd say that. There is no such thing that's uh, easier or harder to predict LTV because, well, it's always hard to get good enough results and it's always challenging. Uh, but uh, I feel that uh, I'm totally agree with the previous topics, but I want to say that uh, we, on the other hand, have much more users to work with. Uh, when we're talking about in-app monetization, we are talking about like 10% of our user base. Uh, we are working with them. And we're talking about uh, value generated by generated by them. But if we're talking about uh, ad revenue game, we are talking about much smaller amounts, like <laughs> ten tenth of, of the cent. But uh, on the other hand, we're working with full our audience and we have much bigger and much more robust uh, sample size. And uh, we can work with it uh, much easier due to amount of users uh, that are watching ads compared to the amount of users uh, that are buying in apps. And uh, for us, uh, it's 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 different approaches. Uh, they are uh, the same in uh, in the core, but uh, they use uh, we we supplement uh, those uh, models with different uh, features. And uh, the admin test games are more, much more about. Uh, engagement features than the monetization ones because uh, well as you said and uh, once again i can only agree there are waterfalls the monetization mediation and uh, those things are not robust and mostly they are not controlled only by us and that's mm -hmm. why we we're relying on others and we do not know what they do for example somebody have tested something or maybe big advertiser camp came to our game and threw money in us. Well, that's always uh, the issue. But on the other hand, we have much more users to to reduce the confidence intervals that we will be getting with our ad LTV models. Um, yeah, an additional question. You both mentioned about A-B testing when developing the RTV models. Do you have a framework for like to share about how to prioritize your A/B test? You know, on the basics, we know usually what gives the most, most revenue. But given the limit, limitation of time, limitation of number of users, usually, how do you do? You have, do you guys have any framework for prioritizing A/B test? Maybe I can start. Right. So yeah. So this is one of the decision making that needs to be done. Like this is one of the crucial aspects in decision making to really because you have only, for example, a few months to, to do some changes. So you need you, you don't you cannot try everything in your game. So this this book can actually make or break uh, some of the projects, I would say. And uh, we use Bayesian uh, testing for this, A-B testing because it's just better for uh, business in general. So even if the, if the is not like a 95% confidence or 90, the Bayesian uh, will uh, show this better and just better for communication with, with the clients. So this is the framework. But in terms of uh, priority, so this is just, in my opinion, expert opinion, 
so the expert knows what has the biggest impact. For example, in terms of if you want to change EAB revenue, you need to focus on the thing that uh, can actually impact the overall revenue the most. Uh, many times um, I've seen uh, A-B tests that actually focus on 5% of something and they, they create 5% of revenue of some sort of in-app start price or something like that. And they create seven A-B tests in five months and then the increase in, the re increase in that start price are like a 600%, but overall revenue is like a 0.5%. So it depends on, uh, on the goals. On the goals so um, the priority uh, in my mind is that what is the uh, can be effect on the overall revenue so this is everything basically for me so I look at the overall revenue uh, what can be expected up uplift and expected impact on overall revenue and then that is the priority that I go, go with I, I'd like to add that uh, well once again, I only can agree with uh, all the words uh, that Robert just said, but uh, I want to add uh, a few things that even uh, with sometimes with a uh, high impact on the ad revenue, we can, we can on the other hand, have uh, like two months of time uh, test running, like with Le LevOps uh, A-B testing. And uh, usually this is not the good way, even if we, if we are waiting for a huge impact, uh, the time needed for testing is also the issue, and we have to also look at this thing uh, to, you know, uh, figure out uh, what we have uh, to try first and uh, the next. But once again, it's almost always comes to some to some sort of exper uh, expert uh, knowledge or uh, mean. Like, I think this will work and uh, well, there is no uh, very good uh, solution to that as far as I know. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe what I would add is that uh, sometimes what ha uh, helps is just try to test like a, um, s you have a big idea, you have like a, like a hypothesis and you just take the core element of it and you test this in a quick time to just well, maybe a little bit validate more that big idea. So not go with the uh, biggest projects, just trying to like, understand that maybe this will give you that confirmation that it is it is really profitable to to spend a little bit more time on, uh, on the development or something. If this makes sense, it is one, one small thing and then you can like uh, do quick testing for that. And many times it actually happens that uh, you see the different results and you say, okay, then uh, maybe this is not a good idea. Let's create something new. Okay. Thank you, guys. I think it was a great session. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, there was like a few questions around like, you know, uh, if we will share the presentations, uh, I hope like, you know, uh, like Ivan and Robert will actually agree to share the presentation. And then after the session, uh, like most likely tomorrow, we will send the uh, like the email with the survey, and then we will include like links to those uh, presentations. Uh, there was the question if the session is recorded. It's recorded, but but then again, we'll talk with with Robert and Ivan if they agree to to share it. And then once they agree, then uh, we'll of course will be happy to share it uh, uh, with you. So then you can actually. Uh, uh, you can uh, watch it uh, again or maybe like focus a little bit more on one specific topic during the, the session. Uh, with that, like Ivan, uh, Lucas, Robert, thank you again uh, for like, you know, for your efforts, spending the time. I hope it was uh, useful uh, uh, for, uh, I'm pretty sure actually it was really useful for the, for the audience. Again, thank you for, for the time. And like all the people actually, of course, I encouraged you to, uh, to join us for now, uh, next uh, sessions. If you would like, and I hope you would like to share your feedback with us, please actually uh, fill out that uh, short survey. Uh, it's again, uh, because it's giving us uh, like information uh, if such sessions uh, are useful or should we continue them uh, to which extent. And, and I really uh, uh, encourage you to do it, do it like you know, bit.ly slash game camp August. Uh, we will uh, add this link to this uh, uh, email that we'll send, but it's quite important point. 
uh, looking at the next slide, that uh, we can actually send those uh, uh, emails uh, only to the people who check in. So if you haven't checked in with the session, please uh, check in. Uh, uh, because then we, we we know that you attended the session and then uh, we can actually send you the survey and the uh, uh, link to the presentation as well. Again, thank you again, and I hope to see you uh, at the, uh, one of the next sessions. Have a, have a good you evening, afternoon, or morning in some cases. Uh, Thank you very much.